Welcome back. My name is Mr. Anger, and uh, we're going to be looking at Physical Science Pace 116 today. I know from experience that this is uh, a pace that gives, tends to give students some difficulty. There's a lot of formulas. Sometimes students who don't feel like they're very good at math and they think they're intimidated, you know, by algebra, uh, they think this is going to be a really hard pace because it does involve doing some math. But if you've had pre-algebra, some Algebra 1, you, you really should be able to be successful with this. And I'm going to show you a trick today, the magic triangle that uh, will really help you be successful with doing a lot of the problems that you'll encounter in this physical science space. Today, as I'm recording this, uh, was going to be a snow day and uh, we ended up with a few students showing up, um, but I'm able to be out of the uh, learning center and go ahead and get these recorded and hopefully these will help some of our students here at our school who get to this point as well as some uh, who maybe are watching this on the PaySuccess.com website. I trust that by this point you've already read the first five pages <clears throat> and uh, you can turn to page B and we're going to look at some of the two problems in particular. I think those two problems if we kind of set them up and go over them will help you be successful with the other problems on page B and uh, then I want to talk to you a little bit about page C and uh, some problems that uh, we'll encounter there and some of the uh, some tips for solving those. Let's talk first about what I call the magic triangle. And uh, this is so useful for lots of problems. In the magic triangle, any formula that can be set up with one quantity over another, so three quantities, one thing equals something divided by something, we can just slide it over and plug it right into this triangle. So notice that the quantity that's on the top, in this case, distance, is going to be on the top of this magic triangle. And then the time and the vo uh, velocity, both of those end up being on the bottom. Now here's the beauty of this. I'm going to show you how easy it is to solve these. If <coughs> we're trying to solve for velocity, then we cover up velocity and we have distance divided by time. If I wanted to find the time, I would cover up the time and notice that distance is divided by velocity. If I wanted to solve for, for the distance, which is on the top, cover that up and notice the velocity and the time are side by side. If quantities are side by side like that, then we just multiply them together. Lots of applications and as we go through this pace, I'm probably going to remind you about the magic triangle with some other equations. Let's introduce the acceleration equation. Now because I'm a math and science teacher and have taught um, physics and chemistry using the Apologia course as well as Bob Jones and of course with the paces here, I like to uh, label this delta V for change in velocity. This Greek symbol delta, it looks like a triangle, is, uh, always represents the, quant the term change in. And often that's what's happening with velocity is we're increasing. Uh, pretend like you're sitting in the car with your mom or dad and they're trying to get around somebody who's driving really slow. They're already traveling at a certain rate of speed, but when they pull into the passing lane, they step on the accelerator and they're increasing their velocity for a period of several seconds until they get in front of that vehicle and then they let their foot off the accelerator and again stay at a constant velocity. During that period of time where they accelerated, they went from one velocity to a higher velocity. So the acceleration would be the difference between those velocities divided by the time. So that's why I like to call this a change in velocity. And then the time is the length of time that that change is taking place. So we could take change in velocity on the top, change in time on the bottom, and then that equals acceleration. So again, to find acceleration, cover that up, divide. If I wanted to find the time, I would cover that up, take the velocity and divide by acceleration. To if I was solving for the change in velocity, I'd cover that up and multiply acceleration times time. All right, so pretty easy to use. Let's apply it now to question 22 on page B in your um, activity pack for pace 116. All right, in that problem, it gives us the distance is 3,600 meters. It tells us that the change in time is uh, six seconds. 
and the, asks the question, what is the velocity in that time? So here's all we have to do. I have a blank magic triangle. Distance is going to go in the top, so I'm going to write the 3,600 up here. I'm going to divide by the time, which is 6 seconds. And so the answer comes out to be 600 meters per second. All right, pretty easy. Now let's go one more step because we need to solve for part B to figure out what it is in kilometers per hour. <clears throat> now this is a concept that was introduced in some earlier paces. And uh, I trust you've also done a little bit of it in your algebra class. We have to set up some conversion factors. So I'm going to take 600 meters and it's per second. So I'm going to put it over one second. And then we're going to convert from meters to kilometers. So I'm going to put meters on the bottom, kilometers on the top. That way, that unit on the top cancels that unit on the bottom. That's what we're trying to do, canceling units. And now I have to think for a second, remember, okay, how many kilometers in a meter or how many meters in a kilometer? Should have that memorized. Kilo means thousand. So this would be one thousand meters is one kilometer. And now, because we're going to hours, we have to do another conversion, and that's to convert from seconds to minutes. And there are 60 seconds in one minute, but now that unit will cancel. And then I have to go once more to go from minutes to hours, so we'll put 60 minutes on the top, one hour on the bottom, and now those units cancel out, all right? Now, using your calculator, you can take the 600 times one, times 60, times 60, all right? And then take that answer, divide by a thousand, and you'll have the number of kilometers per hour. Now, I wanna point out one other thing about these types of problems, and, uh, in your pace. Way back at the very beginning, in, in the first pace of this, of this course, uh, 1109, we talked about significant digits. And uh, when you go to the score key and you check your answer, your answer may look different than what they have in bold as the answer for that problem. And that's because in every single one of these math problems, they are going to apply those rules for significant digits. Now, Honestly, by this point in the year, most physical science students have forgotten what those rules are. Uh, you can go back and rewatch some of the videos that we have for that and remind yourself of those rules. If you take your answer that you get and you look at the score key and just look back, maybe one step back from the final answer that's in bold, hopefully you'll see the answer very, very, very close, okay? and uh, you just don't have it rounded off the way they do. And maybe you wonder, well, how did they round that off? How come their answer is different than mine? If you look back, hopefully you have the same answer one step before they round it off, and the rounding off is due to significant digits. I always tell students, don't fret, don't get frustrated with the significant digits at this point. This point in the game, um, I want you to focus on using the formulas, and remembering how to do these conversions and coming up with the right number, okay? And uh, if you uh, are kind of math inclined and science inclined and you want to uh, think even further and try to come up with that final step using significant figures, go for it. I think that's a great thing to do. But um, if math's not your thing and you at least got to the answer right before the bold answer, you're good, okay? And uh, don't, don't be down on yourself. Don't feel discouraged and mark it wrong and feel like you have the whole page wrong. All right. Let's go on now. Talk about question 23. Let me uh, read the, the problem here. It says a car with a beginning speed of 17 meters per second accelerates to a speed of 47 meters per second during a period of 12 seconds. What is its acceleration? So again, this is where the change in velocity comes in. We went from 17 up to 47. So we subtract and get the difference, which in this case is gonna be 30, right? So let's write 30. Now let's think about the magic triangle. Acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. 
So if I'm solving for this, I'm going to put the 30 in the top, put the 12 in the bottom, and now I divide the top by the bottom. And I'm not going to do the math for you. All right, you can finish the problem. Let's talk for just a second about the units for acceleration. Meters per second per second. It's kind of odd, all right, but it's a change in meters per second, and that change is happening every second. Meters per second could be written this way over seconds. I'm going to put seconds over one. Now, when I have a fraction divided by a fraction, I take this, the one I'm dividing by, the one on the bottom, flip it upside down, invert it, and multiply. So it becomes one over seconds, which ends up being meters per second squared. It blows your mind when you first think about it, because you think, how can time be squared? You can picture, you know, something with dimensions being squared, but time being squared? That's weird. But it really means meters per second per second, but the shortcut is just to write it as meters per second squared. I do want you as a student, as you're going through these problems, to not just come up with the right numbers, but to also think about what units the answer needs to be in and write those units as part of your answer. If you, uh, if you didn't do that, go back and do that, all right? And you need to be able to do that on your checkup and your self-test. They usually tell you what units you're going to have the answer in, and you can look for that. Let's go to page C. I just want to point out something to you on page C before you do that on your own. There are two formulas that are uh, presented on, on pages 4 and 5. This is distance equals one-half the acceleration due to gravity times the time squared. All right, now the acceleration due to gravity, 9.81, all right, you should have that memorized. And then final velocity, the subscript F means final velocity, is acceleration due to gravity times the time. Let's take problem 31. <clears throat> Notice it's what it's asking for. Um, if it took 12 seconds, <clears throat> for the metal to hit the ground, at what altitude was the plane flying? So that's really asking for a, <clears throat> excuse me, a distance. How far did that object fall? And it tells us the length of time that it was falling. So G is given, you know that number. 12 is the time, and that's given. And of course, half, that's just a fraction. So now you can plug all of those three things in and solve for your distance. Altitude there would be the distance that it fell. Look at 32, at what, <clears throat> at what rate of speed was the piece of metal falling just before it hit the ground? So it's referring back to this problem. So we're going to use the same time of 12 seconds. And of course we know 9.81, and this is asking for what was the final velocity. So you're going to use this formula to solve for 32. 33 says a rock falling from a cliff attained a speed of 73.5 meters per second just before it hit the ground. How long did it take the rock to hit the ground? All right, let's apply the magic triangle and use it for this problem right here. <clears throat> because I have two quantities being multiplied together, I'm going to put them in the bottom and the final velocity on the top. In this problem, it tells us the final velocity is the 73.5. And we, of course, we know what G is, all right, 9.81. All we have to do to find the time using the magic triangle is take the final velocity, divide by 9.81, and you'll have the time. I would run that off to about two decimal places. <clears throat> And uh, you're going to use that answer from 33 now to solve 34. 34 says, how high was the cliff? Okay, height is distance. So we're right back to this formula right here. Once you know the time from 33, you can plug that in for time. 9.81, one half, and you have the distance. I'm not going to go over 35 and 36. I think if you get those four set up, and then go ahead and check those, make sure you're on the right track, 
And then you should be able to do 35 and 36 on your own, as well as going back and the ones on page B, hopefully you can do on your own. Hopefully that was helpful. And use that magic triangle whenever you can. Not just in physical science, try it in your algebra.